Then, gentlemen, let us begin with plenary session under the theme of New Directions and Challenges of Korean STI Policies in the Global Contexts. We will have keynote presentation from Dr. Robert D. Atkinson, President, Information Technology and Innovation Foundation, first, and the panel discussion with various experts in STI fields will be followed. We will meet Dr. Robert D. Atkinson online, and he will make a presentation titled, Korea's Next SNT Challenges. Please welcome Dr. Robert Atkinson for the keynote presentation on screen. Wonderful. So thank you so much for having me here. I'm kind of getting feedback here. I don't know if there's a way to fix that. I'm getting feedback on my sound. But anyway, it's a pleasure to be with you. Um, I have great respect for what Steppy does and, uh, and the work and, and for Korea generally. Uh, we, we study Korea. There's a lot, to me, the Korean uh, country is a country that takes innovation policy quite seriously and thinks about it as a sophisticated enterprise that needs analysis and creativity. So I'm really delighted and honored that you would have me speak to you today. Let me um, share my screen and okay. There we go. Okay. So for those of you who don't know, ITIF is a think tank. We're based in Washington, D.C. We're about 15 years old and um, we focus on policies of how to drive innovation-based growth and progress, a wide variety of, of policy areas and a wide variety of technology areas. Certainly IT or ICT because it's in our name, but also uh, smart manufacturing, life sciences, clean energy, and other areas. So why are we having this conversation now? I think there's really two main reasons for this conversation, for this if you will, pivot point or turning point as to rethinking innovation and technology policies, not just in Korea, but really all around the world. Um, one of them, as an earlier speaker alluded to, is the fourth industrial revolution. This emerging wave of technologies that uh, in many ways are a blend of both digital technologies and atom-based technologies or physical technologies whereas the last wave or the current wave was really much more of a pure IT wave, uh, software and other kinds of systems. This next wave is gonna be about the integration or blending of the physical systems with the digital systems. And that is, that's a big change and it's gonna mean differing, um, differing competitive positions that countries will attain or lose uh, as these new technologies become more important, not just in their own right, but in infusing and transforming many, uh, if not all traditional sectors like agriculture, like manufacturing, like logistics. The second is obviously China. Uh, we wouldn't be having this conversation, I believe, if it were not for China. Uh, China is a th competitive threat to virtually any technology economy today. They're advancing very rapidly uh, they're using, in some cases, illegitimate or inappropriate uh, means to do that. And it means that every country who has technology aspirations has to think through what does China mean for our uh, technology economy and, and our strategy. So I really want to do three things in my time. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about Korea's position in advanced industries based on a a new ITIF report that we'll be releasing in a couple of weeks. Um, the second, my sense of what are some of the major challenges facing Korea, and thirdly, solutions. I would definitely caveat that I don't pretend to be an expert in the Korean economy. You all are the experts, but I hopefully can provide sometimes an outsider's view uh, or it's outsider's perspective uh, can be helpful. Um, especially one that I think is informed by looking all around the world, uh, what are countries doing with regard to technology policy. So this is a, a slide 
This is using OECD data, looking at seven major industries that we would identify as the seven most important advanced industries or technology-driven industries. Pharmaceuticals, um, electrical equipment, machinery and equipment, motor vehicles, other transportation equipment, and that would include aerospace, uh, shipbuilding, and high-speed rail, computer and electronic equipment, uh, essentially hardware, and then lastly, IT and, and other ser information services. These would be software and, uh, and, and applications. And then lastly, total. So what you see there is really the bars for three years, 1995, 2006, and the most recent OECD data are, are for 2018. And what you see is a, a pretty significant progress on, on many of these indicators. Uh, if you go all the way to the right, you see the total. Uh, you can see that Korea's global share of these industries has grown from a little bit over 2% uh, 25 years ago now to a little bit over 4%. So Korea has essentially taken market share. You've grown your industries and you've, you've been able to expand them um, in very significant ways. And then obviously the, the, the clear uh, outli outlier here is computer and electronics where uh, companies like Samsung, obviously SK Hynix and others um, really are among the leaders in the world now. And you can see that is skyrocketing from 4% to say about 11, almost 11%. Now the next part of that analysis is a little different. And what it does is it focuses on what economists, regional economists would call location quotient. But essentially what this is, is it says for each of these industries, how big is it as a share of the Korean economy? At, with compared to how big is it as a share of the global economy. So in other words, if you look at the pharma numbers, the pharmaceutical industry, the, the biopharma industry, biotech and, 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 um, and regular pharmaceuticals, it's not a big industry for Korea, uh, re even relative to the Korean size. Korea is not as big an economy as the US obviously. So if you control for the size of the Korean economy and compared to that and compare it to the world, Korea underperforms in pharmaceuticals. Yet when you look at electrical equipment, uh, Korea went from having less than the global average to now having more than twice as much. Machinery and equipment, oh, I'm sorry. There we go, machinery and equipment gone up. Uh, motor vehicles, interesting. I, given the number of Kia ads that I see every time I watch basketball now in the US, uh, I'm in, inundated with ads for Kia cars. <laughs> I would have thought motor vehicles would have gone up a little, but but what you really see there is um, is, is is I think two three important things there. One is computer and electronics and optical technology. Uh, Korea is essentially five times, four times more con concentrated in that industry. That is that is the core. And I'm obviously not saying anything you don't know, but I think it's interesting to put it into this perspective. Korea is underperforming in IT and other information services, which I'll talk a little bit about. In other words, Korea is very good at the hardware side, uh, but when you look at the software side there, whether it's just pure software or applications, uh, Korea has a smaller share of that in, in their economy than the global average does. And finally, when you look at the um, just overall total, you can see that the Korean economy has gotten significantly more technology focused advanced technology industries have become a bigger share of the Korean economy over the past 25 years. And to the point now where the Korean economy is twice as specialized in these advanced industries as the global average. So that clearly is something you all should be extremely proud of. That's a hard thing to do. And uh, Korea is, is doing uh, quite well there. Now, if you look at uh, this with a comparison of, of some countries, um, let me move this here. Um, you know, what you see there is it's, it's a couple of things. One is uh, obviously the share is related to the size of the country. Uh, the U.S. has big shares because it has a, a big part of the global economy. What I think is striking about this chart, though, is the significant rise of China. Not, again, surprising, but going from 4% to almost 20% or excuse me, 22%. And then the very, very rapid decline of Japan. 
uh, Japan uh, in 1995, we, the U.S. saw Japan as our major competitor, our, by far the major technology competitor to America. And what you've seen is the Korean, uh, sorry, the Japanese share has, has gone down uh, quite, quite dramatically. Now, uh, if you look at the shares of these industries in terms of their own economy, uh, in other words, which of these countries is the advanced, are advanced industries the biggest share? And what you, oops, sorry, what, what you see there is that Taiwan, only Taiwan in the, in the sample of countries that I've selected, only Taiwan has a bigger advanced share. And that's largely because of electronic components and companies like TSMC. Uh, as you can see, Korea did very well there, has gone up to almost twice as much. Uh, Japan, relatively stable. Uh, Germany doing quite well, even though um, overall Europe has not done well. And also China has actually gone down. And what that reflects is the rapid growth of the Chinese economy overall has outpaced the growth of their advanced technology sector which is a little bit striking because the Chinese put in place may, uh, excuse me, in 2006, they put in place the MLP, the medium and long-term plan, but they certainly haven't gained share. And the last part of that slide I'll, I'll, I'll suggest you focus on, and that's the U.S. share. This was a, frankly, a surprise to us. Uh, we had thought the U.S. would have been higher, but the U.S. actually now, is below average in terms of advanced industry output. That's not the same as saying we're below average in R&D or in innovation, but when you put it all together, innovation and output, sorry, innovation and production, the U.S. now is about six percentage points below the national average on advanced industries. Uh, we do well on information, as you would imagine. Uh, we do well on uh, aerospace and we do well on pharmaceuticals, but on the rest, we're not doing very well. So again, when I look at that slide, I, to me, Korea is the number two country in the world uh, when it comes to specialization in advanced industries. Now, clearly that doesn't mean that Korea or any country can rest on, its la on your laurels. Challenges come up every single day. So let me suggest, in, again, from my outside perspective, what I think are a few major challenges. Um, one is, uh, sorry, um, challenge. So one is what you could term industrial dualism, innovation dualism, my apologies. This is the uh, Hirschenfeld, Hirschenfeld, Hirsch, Hirschman Hirschen, Hirschenfeld index, which is essentially a concentration index on R&D of the largest four R&D spenders in each country. And this the numbers are dramatic. Uh, the U.S. R&D portfolio is spread across uh, 100 major companies uh, and many, many more beyond that. Whereas in Korea, R&D is concentrated in just a few country, a few major firms that we all know. And that's not to say that nobody else does R&D in Korea. It's just to say that corporate R&D is much more concentrated there. I'm not making to be clear, just to be clear, I'm not making an antitrust case or competition policy case. I, I don't know enough to say that one way or the other. Scale matters. And when you're in a small country, you need company, you need, you're going to have big, big com com companies. What I am saying though, is it suggests that one of the challenges for Korea, in my opinion, is to build up mid-sized companies that are R&D based or startups that can begin to move that number down, if you will, and, and, and spread out uh, R&D and innovation uh, among a broader set of firms uh, within Korea. And I know that's happening, uh, but I would just suggest that seems like an important challenge, particularly given how uncertain it is for any firm now. Uh, you look at a firms in the US like Intel that was riding high 10 years ago and is now in a restructuring mode. Uh, so. There's current success is no, no, uh, no guarantee of future success for any firm anymore. The second challenge <clears throat> to me would be uh, really building up the software AI side of the Korean economy. Um, the U.S. is 
not as strong in areas like mechanical engineering, even electrical engineering. But we're very strong when it comes to software. We're very strong when it comes to uh, you know, when it comes to AI. And when you look at this, this is the this is basically uh, the top fifty percent by quality of all AI publications over the last you know eight, 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 40 years or whatever. And you see that the U.S. is two and a half times higher than Korea. Um, you've got a few countries uh, like Canada, Australia that are also doing quite well. So it suggests to me that one of the challenges for Korea is to build up alongside the excellent mechanical, electrical engineering strengths of Korea, is to build up the software strengths, uh, including now in machine learning and AI, where to, right now it's really China and the US that are, that are in the lead. The third challenge, <clears throat> a little bit related to the first, and that's how can, how can Korea really build up its entrepreneurial technology-driven startups that want to grow and want to become unicorns and end up becoming unicorns. Com unicorns meaning uh, companies with over a billion dollars in sales that are new. You can see the U.S., no surprise, we're the leader. Uh, that's what the U.S. does extremely well. We, we innovate, we build new companies, one of the challenges for the U.S. is sometimes that production goes offshore, but we we are a machine of creating new companies. Uh, Korea is doing uh, better than Japan, that's for sure. Uh, the Japanese economy is not a very entrepreneurial economy, uh, but it's certainly not doing as well as countries like Canada or Australia. It's a little bit on par with China, but but I would set a goal perhaps of. You know, could that number go from essentially 0 0.2 to 0 0.4 over the next six, eight years? Um, and that would be something to me, I would track that and say, how are our policies affecting the ability of companies to be able to grow? The, um, the other challenge is, is what you could call R&D efficiency. One of the things that I would hope and suggest that you should be very proud of in Korea is the highest maybe Israel's higher, I can't remember, the, clearly the highest or second highest rate of R&D per GDP. And that's a wonderful thing, that's a great thing. But the question though is how much real output are you getting from that R&D? And there's very, it's very hard to measure that, but one measure is triadic patents per billion dollar of R&D. Triadic patents meaning patents that are filed in Japan, Europe, and the US. And Korea's doing better than the US, that's, that's clear, but nowhere near as well as Japan, which uh, is four times more successful, four times more efficient. Uh, Germany looks like it's about 70%. Finland is, is real stronger. So I think it's an important question to ask, how well is this R&D money being spent uh, to get real innovation? Patents are one area, um, gazelles, excuse me, uh, uh, high growth companies are another. Okay, so the last challenge is obviously, how should Korea think about this conflict? This is, to me is, a, this is gonna be a conflict that's not gonna go away for the next 30 or 40 years. It's in my opinion, similar to the Cold War and at least in terms of length and superpower tensions. Um, China is showing no signs of becoming more Western. They're showing no signs of not wanting to be the global hegemon and not wanting to be the global technology leader. Um, and that is, in my opinion, that tension is going to get worse. This was not something that the Trump administration created. The Trump administration was simply a reflection of reality. And uh, you'll see, I believe, tomorrow tomorrow, or excuse me, Thursday in the U.S., um, the White House is releasing its uh, China strategy, uh, which is long awaited. And my sense is it's going to say essentially Trump, Trumpism was right, but it just wasn't calculated and carried out the right way, but the focus was right. Um, that's my sense of what the Biden folks will say, but we'll see. Okay, so what are some of the, um, what are some of the possible solutions? Um, let me start with, I think, this whole question of university technology transfer and industry engagement. 
The United States has a lot of innovation policy weaknesses, I would argue, but we do have some real strengths. And this to me is the number one US strength. We've built ecosystems and policy arrangements that really do encourage our universities to work with industry, to support entrepreneurship, to transfer technology, to license technology, to patent technology. And some of that maybe is just unique to the culture here, uh, but, but a lot of it I think is, is about conscious decisions. And, and let, me, let me suggest a few things perhaps that Korea might do there. Uh, one would simply be uh, to make university funding more contingent upon real results. It's surprising to me how few countries do that. They just keep giving money to universities for basic research and they don't hold them accountable. They don't even measure oftentimes what the impact of what the research is doing on the overall Korean economy. So clearly there's great metrics you can, one can count how much industry R&D is funding at universities, how many new business were created out of the university research, how many patents, how many licenses whole set of things like that, that the Korean uh, steppe or others could measure and then publicize that and make it clear uh, which Korean universities are the best and which ones are the worst. And then the next step would be, in, again, in my opinion, would be to start allocating a small share of university research funding along those lines. This is something that Scandinavian countries of Finland and Sweden have started to do where if you're a university that really takes this seriously and really tries to focus on getting your research a little bit more aligned with industry, um, that the government gives can give more money. This doesn't mean by any stretch of the imagination that somehow you're just going to be taking away the core mission of universities, which is to train the next generation and to conduct early stage basic and applied research. But you can do that in ways that are very uh, supportive of industry research. I use a couple of examples. In, in the United States, the University of California at San Diego has a great electrical engineering program, but that program specializes in wireless technology, wireless R&D, because Qualcomm is there. And, and now a whole lot of other, I, I'm sure Samsung is there, and I know that Ericsson is there as well. So they've aligned the university with the industry needs and they're very, it's very porous. They talk to each other. The academics are interested in what the technology problems of the, of the companies are. There's industry, uh, university co-op programs for the engineers. So there's a whole set of things that one could do to really bring universities more to be a bigger engine or driver of that kind of growth. Um, Industry, excuse me, universities will often kick and scream. Uh, they hate it, they don't wanna do it. But if you look at the best universities in the United States in terms of academic rankings, most of them are also the best in the United States at working with industry and tech transfer. Places like Stanford, Caltech, um, MIT. I was up at MIT a few years ago and uh, we were speaking at the, um, there's a new cancer in research institute and, there was a Nobel Prize winner who we were speaking with who had, uh, he was on his third biotech startup. He was quite wealthy, quite wealthy man, but he uh, was still teaching at MIT because he loved teaching. He loved research and he loved teaching. But MIT, and he had a partner who was doing similar work at Harvard. The partner had no companies because Harvard would not let the professor take a leave of absence for two years to go start a company. MIT had a very different policy. They not only allowed it, they encouraged it and they provided help, handholding, assistance. Um, and so that's why MIT has spun off more companies. If you take the company spun off of MIT, uh, it's bigger than the GDP of Korea. Um, another, another example recently, I was talking to somebody who was heading up, you know, heading up tech transfer for Stanford. And I said, uh, I was chatting before an event we were holding in Washington on this and I said, you know, how's it going? Are you, are you making money from your licensing? And said, well, yeah, we're, we're making, we're doing well. Uh, there was a company, uh, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago that um, there were a couple of grad students who were working on a National Science Foundation grant. They had this idea 
And um, so we decided to help them uh, commercialize the idea in exchange for uh, like a 1% equity. Uh, and the, uh, the, the grad students were uh, Sergey Brin uh, and um, uh, his, his partner, and it was, it was Google. And that's not uncommon for Stanford. It's, it's not an accident. So my point is, I, think, I do think policy can help change university culture and, and, and get them to be more thinking about that. So that's, that would be one step. Uh, a second, <clears throat> excuse me, would be around high growth entrepreneurship. One very specific uh, suggestion I would have is we recently, ITI have recently conducted a study looking at um, not only R&D tax credits, but innovation boxes and a whole set, all the, all, the tech, all the tax policies countries have to spur R&D and innovation. What we found when we looked just at the R&D tax credit is that Korea out of 34 countries, so the OECD countries and then the BRIC, uh, Russia, China, Brazil, uh, and India, uh, the R&D tax credit in Korea is half, less than half of what it is in the United States. It's 16% of the Chinese credit and it's 27% of the median credit in, the, in these countries. So Korea actually ranks near the bottom of all these countries that we analyzed in terms of R&D tax credit. I haven't studied the R&D credit in Korea. I, I just can say among the academic research, the scholarly research in the U.S. that's looked at it over the past 20 years, it's consistent finding that the R&D credit spurs at least a dollar twenty of R&D for every dollar of credit, if not more. Uh, a second part there is culture. I, I think culture is very much more important than I think a lot of people think when it comes to high growth entrepreneurship. There was a recent study, and I have the, I'm sorry, I don't remember where, so I have it in my notes, um, but it was a global survey and it asked people uh, in, in multiple countries questions about risk taking. And one question was simply, are you, will, I, am, I am willing to take risks. Do you agree or disagree? Only 10% of Koreans said they were willing to take risks. Uh, compared to 35% of Americans. There was another question is, people who started a small business that failed, should they be given a second chance? 25% of Koreans said yes, 50% of Americans said yes. Uh, and lastly, um, there was a survey that the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor did recently, and they asked, um, would you, are you, would you, st are, are you not starting a company because of the fear, a fear of failure? Korea ranked second last to Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan was last. Korea was second last in terms of fear of starting a company because of failure. How do you solve that problem is a really tough question, but I do think that ultimately Korea is going to have to be more focused on high tech entrepreneurship or high growth entrepreneurship. And um, sometimes that is related to culture. Uh, one of the things the United States did, for example, 20 years ago, we led the world in a movement of teaching entrepreneurship in colleges. So virtually every college now has an integrated entrepreneurship uh, track in their business schools. We have a lot of engineering schools now that teach entrepreneurship and engineering concurrently. Uh, Stanford, uh, MIT, uh, a number of others. Um, just celebrating entrepreneurs. Uh, you know, could the new president, the new administration, could there be an annual three awards for the best high growth entrepreneurs, tech entrepreneurs in Korea. So I, I, I'm just throwing out ideas because I think it's an interesting question that nobody's researched enough. Uh, how do you start to move the needle on, on some of these questions? Asking some of the major large Korean companies, would you sponsor entrepreneurs? Would you engage in an entrepreneurship program of partnering and training? So there may be some ideas there. A third, um, area I want to focus on is, is AI, the cloud, um, and software. When you look at uh, the most recent studies on this, um, in, uh, not le in, in the, leaving out the U.S., which is very high, by the way, uh, looking at firms uh, with 10 workers or more, only 12.9% had adopted, the, had, used, had moved to the cloud versus 30% in the other country. So almost three times more cloud migration in these other countries than in Korea. 
Uh, Korea ranked 29 out of 33 of these OECD countries in terms of using the cloud. Korea ranked, is, is below average in the OECD in IT capital investments by all firms, uh, logistics, hotels, services, you name it. I'm sure your big IT companies invest a lot in IT, but what about the rest of the economy? So I think that that question of how do you spur broader and uh, more robust uh, business adoption of AI is pretty critical. Um, and at the same time, build up the skills, whether that's uh, computer science programs and all the high schools, uh, just making sure that you're funding the best AI and computer science graduate schools and graduate programs. Uh, last thing I'll just say on that is I think there's a, we're quite worried when we look at how governments are approaching the question of AI, um, because I think there's a real risk of overregulation and, and almost precautionary principle thinking about AI. And I look at Europe as really going down that path the farthest and the fastest, and I don't say that as a compliment. I think Europe is shooting itself in the foot uh, in terms of its future AI capabilities uh, because of how stringent the current and proposed rules will be. Um, we just, we just uh, wrote a, a, a little report on our website was talking, talking about uh, AI bias. And the title was something along the lines of AI bias um, being worked on, or fix, AI bias fixable, human bias, not so much. And there's this view out there that AI is inherently biased, will always be biased and needs strong government regulation. At minimum, I think that's premature. Um, I, virtually every company I know, big and small, that is working on AI is aware of the bias challenge from the bias data sets and others. They're working on it, they're making progress. So I guess the, the, the short answer would be, I would just be very careful about regulating too fast and too much uh, when it comes to AI. We just don't know how companies are gonna use AI, how they wanna develop it. And to me, erring on the side of light touch rather than heavy touch at this point in time would be, uh, would be uh, appropriate. Um, and the last point is, would, would just be around creative destruction. As you all know, that term came from Joseph Schumpeter, the famous uh, Austrian economist who came to the US for most of his latter part of his career. And I think what people are attracted to from that, from Schumpeter, Ism, and we, we think of ourselves as a Schumpeterian think tank, is the creative part. That's the easy part. Who, who can be against the creative part? It's the destructive part that I think causes more challenges. And what Schumpeter's real insight was is you can't have the creativity without the destruction. And I think that's absolutely true. And if you look at a sector, for example, like fintech, FinTech is potentially destruct, very destructive or disruptive of the current financial services industry. Might not be, maybe the fi current financial services industry will transform itself. Um, there's a great quote by Clay Christensen, uh, unfortunately passed away, but Clay was uh, with Harvard Business School. And a, and a great quote where he said, if you, don't, if you aren't willing to um, disrupt your own business, someone will do it for you. And I think with a mistake where governments make is they wanna prevent businesses from being disrupted. And I think that's a fundamental mistake. Uh, you see that for example, in uh, I'll be blunt, in, in, in the taxi industry where the US sector is so much better because of Uber and Lyft. It just is so much better. It's more productive, it's higher quality, consumers are happy. Yeah, the taxi drivers didn't like it, um, but the notion in America is that's, that's what America is. And some things get destroyed and some things are created. So I would caution um, Korea or encourage Korea to not go down the European path of the precautionary principle, where essentially we wanna be careful of not destroying things. You know, case in point for Korea is biotech, uh, excuse me, ag biotech, uh, where uh, my understanding is that there are limitations in agricultural biotech use in, in Korea. And to me, when you look at climate change and, and the fact that we're going to have climate change, it's inevitable. Hopefully we can make it less bad than it will be. We're going to have to have genetically modified crops that are drought resistant, heat resistant, et cetera. 
So that's going to require an enormous amount of innovation. And uh, I think that countries are, that are on the side of that um, will do better than countries that try to resist that. Now, I know it's easy for me to say I'm not a politician. I'm not an elected official. So I don't mean to underestimate how challenging that is. But I do think it's important for innovation policy experts in Korea to at least be talking about the importance of that. And the last point I'll just make is China. I don't have anything all that profound to say about China. I would just say two things. One is I think what the Trump administration proved was that it is impossible to change China's internal behavior. They're gonna do what they're gonna do. Um, they've got too much power now for other countries to really hold them hostage. Uh, so the China, China will go ahead with its China Made in China 2025 strategy, its standards 2035 strategy, and, and all of the other things it wants to do. Where I think Western countries and allied countries, democratic countries, market-oriented countries should work is to limit the benefits that China gets from the more, um, the more mercantilist or inappropriate parts of that behavior. So when they steal chip designs, from one of us, which they've done, or when they massively subsidize chip producers. And I'm not talking about some subsidies. You, you've subsidized your chip producers. The US is about to pass the CHIPS Act, but well, we'll do some of that. I'm talking about sort of being so far out of bounds that you're not even close. Um, force tech transfer, et cetera. Everything. So I think one of the things that I would encourage Korea to do, assuming the US ultimately takes leadership on this, would be to really think about how we can all cooperate to let China know that they just can't benefit from things like IP theft and throw it into their products and expect to sell it um, in, uh, in other markets. So um, with that, I thank you so much. And uh, I don't know if there's any, I'm looking forward to the discussion after this. Uh, I really appreciate you uh, um, letting me have a chance to spoke. I, I also just want to pitch uh, a new uh, publication we've created online with uh, about 20 other scholars in the U.S. and, and in some other countries called National Development, and it's on uh, it's on a webzine called uh, uh, Medium, um, and it's a posting of really I think very interesting, thoughtful articles about the role of government in industrial or particularly technology development. What are the challenges? What are the opportunities? So uh, I encourage you to take a look at it. It's a, obviously it's free. Um, it might be of interest, and if there's folks who are interested in contributing uh, to that, it's an open open pu journal publication. We're always looking for new contributors. So, again, thank you so much. My contact information is there, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, Dr. Robert D. Atkinson, for your presentation. Now, we will have a 25-minute break, and the panel discussion with various experts in STI fields will be followed at 11.30. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, let us begin the panel discussion. This panel discussion focuses on the directions and challenges addressed in the keynote presentation. We are grateful to have Dr. Yong Seok Chang, Senior Research Fellow at STEPI as moderator, and three panelists. Also, Dr. Robert Atkinson is waiting for us online. Please welcome moderator Dr. Zhang and panelists to the floor. Thank you, thank you so much, and uh, uh, good uh, morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. Um, um, I have to apologize to uh, uh, Dr. Atkinson to hold you late night. Okay, and um, well, we just uh, had a, a very great uh, presentation from the uh, uh, Dr. Atkinson. Um, he pointed out many um, uh, critical, uh, critical points that uh, uh, Korea has to um, you know, pay attention to uh, carefully. Uh, to summarize very briefly, uh, he pointed out the, uh, uh, some challenges, uh, including uh, innovation dualism and AI focus and unicorns and uh, R&D efficiency and political choice, especially you know, China uh, risk. And also, he uh, you know uh, provided uh, some solutions, uh, recommended some solutions, including we have to uh, 
you know, further um, uh, improve our university tech uh, transfer and industry engagement. And also, uh, we need to uh, uh, encourage uh, high growth entrepreneurship, uh, especially unicorns. And also, we have to pay attention to uh, uh, developing uh, and making uh, our uh, competitiveness in AI. And also, um, he pointed out uh, creative uh, destruction uh, should be uh, more encouraged. And also, the last one was uh, China risk. He pointed out, well, um, with this um, wonderful, uh, you know, kickoff uh, presentation, uh, I'd like to, uh, you know, manage um, uh, moderating this uh, panel uh, discussion with the three uh, distinguished uh, panelists. Uh, two uh, from outside, uh, one from uh, inside. Uh, thank you for, uh, uh, you know, accepting uh, this panel uh, discussion. Uh, probably uh, we can have um, about uh, three uh, rounds of discussion uh, uh, on this. Uh, uh, probably uh, we can hear uh, from our panelists on uh, how they uh, think about uh, this uh, kickoff presentation and that they may add uh, some questions and uh, their opinions as well. Uh, and. And then we can, uh, on second round, would like to uh, invite uh, further um, uh, discussions, uh, including uh, questions and uh, additions. And lastly, I'd like to invite uh, some uh, floor uh, questions and uh, comments, uh, even online as well. So no further delay, I'd like to um, uh, introduce our uh, three uh, distinguished uh, panelists. I would like to you know, introduce uh, one by one when I uh, invite uh, their uh, intervention. Uh, the first, I'd like to uh, invite um, uh, Professor Andrew uh, Grotto. Uh, he is a professor at uh, Stanford University. Specifically, he is uh, William J. Uh, Perry. International Security Fellow uh, at the Cyber Policy Center and uh, Research Fellow at the Hoover uh, Institution, uh, both at the uh, Stanford University. Uh, Professor Grotto uh, is mainly uh, focused on national security and cyber security uh, issues. Uh, he uh, has um, uh, diverse uh, uh, positions uh, before uh, joining the uh, Stanford. Uh, he worked at the uh, White House and uh, even uh, Congress as well. Um, he uh, graduate, um, uh, he has a, a JD from the University of California at Berkeley and a master's at uh, Harvard University and a bachelor's at uh, University of Kentucky. I'd like to uh, invite uh, the first um, a panelist, uh, Professor Grotto, hand over to you. Great. Well, well thank you, uh, Dr. Zhang. Uh, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to be here. I only wish I could be there in person. I'm looking forward to um, a return to normalcy, whatever that looks like um, when uh, travel becomes easier and, 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 and more regular. Uh, until then, though, um, here we are on Zoom. Um, um, I, I want to focus um, on China. Um, and in particular, uh, I want to I pick up on, on um, uh, Dr. Atkinson's um, uh, points on China, which, which I agree with and, and will extend. Um, and maybe I'll even put, put, a, put a, a sharper point on it. Um, he showed a, a, a graph where um, share of... Um, that depicted uh, global shares of advanced um, industry output. And the story, uh, a main takeaway from that, uh, that slide is the dramatic growth um, uh, from China and the precipitous decline um, in Japan, along with growth um, in Korea. And you know, since these are shares of advanced uh, ind industry output, um, the pie is, is finite here. And uh, my message, uh, you know, this is a debate we have here in the United States. I think it, it carries over 
uh, to our allies, uh, South Korea, Japan, uh, our allies in, in Europe, Taiwan, that uh, China has its sights set on that share. And they will use um, uh, means to compete, many of which are legitimate and welcome insofar as they promote innovation, uh, you know, help keep uh, prices uh, for consumers low, help keep uh, industry inputs uh, low, uh, but they will also use means that uh, by any measure are inappropriate, unfair, uh, and unacceptable. And that, that latter um, component of, of the challenge presented by China is what I wanna spend a few minutes talking about. Um, I'll, I'll start by um, sort of picking up this, this thread that, um, that, that the US and China are these hegemons um, you know, in the early stages of a, a multi-decade conflict. I think that is certainly true. Um, but I'm also not willing to uh, accept uh, a framing that this is simply uh, a battle between hegemons. Um, this is a, a conflict, a competition between uh, different approaches to, um, to governance, to different approaches to mm -hmm. capitalism, uh, and different approaches to uh, human values. And in a way, I think when, when we frame this this challenge as a US-China problem, I think from my perspective, we let a lot of our allies off the hook. Um, when, you know, at the end of the day, this is really a competition about values. And that doesn't mean that all of our allies, uh, Korea, Japan, our European friends, Taiwan, are going to see the challenge the same way that those of us in the United States uh, tend to. It doesn't mean that we're going to necessarily agree on what the right a mix of policy interventions is uh, to, to manage this, this challenge. Um, it does mean, however, that we all, I think, are in effect on the same side, as it were. Um, and I think, you know, our, our collective challenge moving forward is how to um, build a deeper, more enduring um, allied uh, cooperation around all of the challenges that China presents, including, of course, our, our, our focus today, innovation and, and, and technology, um, while at the same time um, uh, managing the inevitable differences uh, that will emerge. Um, I think uh, semiconductors um, is going to present us all with a, a, a really important um, case study uh, with you know, real world um, heavy duty implications. Um, semiconductors, you know, have, have come of, of geopolitical age in the same way that um, petroleum did in the 1970s as a result of the OPEC um, oil embargo. And, um, you know, the supply chain uh, shortages have been painful. Uh, you know, the automo automobile industry alone has suffered uh, somewhere north of $200 billion in lost revenue uh, just in 2021 due to shortages. Um, a, Goldman Sachs, a Goldman Sachs study estimated, has estimated that, uh, that US GDP has been shaped by up to 1% as, as a result of the shortage. Um, some of the reasons for the strain are ephemeral uh, and will naturally ease with time. The COVID-19 pandemic, fires, drought, you know, winter storms, uh, all conspired to make the past couple of years an extraordinarily challenging period uh, for the semiconductor industry. But the fact that these incidents had such impact highlights an obvious uh, need for greater resiliency. But many of the other factors behind the strain have been years in the making, the result of complex um, and potentially lasting uh, geopolitical and economic factors, including China's rise, the relentless digitalization of global economies, climate change. Um, and what I, what I think um, we, uh, you know, sort of the, the, the liberal market-oriented democracies need to do, um, and, and again, I think, I think Semiconductors presents us with a golden opportunity to, um, to try to achieve this, is come together and identify um, uh, where um, we have um, asymmetric interdependencies with China that um, put China in a position to you know, use those interdependencies um, to um, um, essentially you know, impose um, harm uh, as leverage uh, on, on the U.S. and its allies. 
Um, I think we need to, um, and, and that requires, I think, a, a very careful look at, um, at um, uh, you know, technology and really tr trying to really drill into which technologies are truly strategic, um, which ones present, for example, choke points um, in the supply chain, uh, which ones are accelerants of innovation, um, and and really you know focus our attentions on ensuring that 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 our our, our innovation our collective innovation um, you know uh, advances um, our economic and security interests um, and and, and um, I think there's also a risk of, of subsidy races here um, you know especially in the area of, of semiconductors um, and then last but not least um, inevitably. Um, this is an area where security and economic interests um, really can come into tension. And um, the, the, the antidote to this, I think, um, is, is a need to build trust among um, the US, Korea, uh, Japan, Taiwan. Um, and trust, I think, starts with, uh, with transparency. So in the case of semiconductors, um, what I would like to see is a lot more transparency about, um, about government support for that sector um, deeper collaboration um, in terms of, of uh, market intelligence on um, supply chain problems, um, and possibly, um, and this this is where I'll, I'll wrap up. You know, looking at, at, at the degree of allied unity uh, that's been achieved vis-a-vis Russia um, in the aftermath of its war on Ukraine around export controls and sanctions, and, and seizing this moment to think in a strategic, thoughtful, careful way how to take that unity and rethink the way that um, we have historically done export controls and sanctions. Um, you know, the four incumbent regimes were not designed with anything like, you know, the, 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 this, this competition um, in mind. Um, changing those, those four regimes uh, is going to be really hard, not least because Russia is a voting member in three out of four of them. And so I think um, it's going to really fall on the U.S. and its allies to, to um, exercise leadership to, to identify um, a way forward here. Uh, so why don't I stop there and, and um, turn it back to uh, Dr. Zhang for others. Thank you. Thank you so much, yeah, Professor Grotto. Um, uh, you, uh, you know, just uh, touched uh, some uh, the issue of uh, a geopolitical conflict with uh, uh, China especially, uh, but also uh, Russia as well. Um, well, uh, we need uh, more, more uh, you know, uh, collaboration uh, between, um, you know, that this uh, 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 free market, um, you know, economies and uh, more uh, transparency on that. Um, but uh, uh, there's uh, other uh, arguments as well. Uh, uh, we will come back to <coughs> Sorry, we'll come back to the, this issue after our, our first round of this uh, discussion. Okay, um, not for the delay, uh, let me uh, invite uh, the second um, uh, panelist, uh, who is right now, I uh, think uh, you are in uh, Vienna, um, Professor uh, uh, Nicholas Vonortes, uh, he is Okay, let me see. <laughs> Where is my uh, notes on him? Um, he is a, a professor of economics and international affairs and uh, also director of Institute for uh, International Science and Technology Policy at uh, George Washington University. He is also uh, currently uh, holds the uh, Sao Paulo Excellence Chair uh, in um, uh, UNICAMP in Brazil. Uh, also, he uh, is um, a research fellow at uh, National Research University Higher uh, School of Economics, uh, HSE, in short, uh, in Moscow. And uh, also, he uh, uh, you know, completed a you know, uh, visiting uh, fellowship at the Tsinghua University as well. Well, uh, he also uh, very much, you know, um, uh, concerted many um, uh, government, including uh, Korea as well. <laughs> you, you have the deep knowledge on uh, Korea as well. So, you now for the delay, I would like to invite your uh, comments on uh, 
this issue. Okay, thank you, Yongshun. Do you hear me well? Sure. Because I get an echo on my side. Um, uh, thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Um, I very much appreciate uh, the opportunity to be with you today. Indeed, I am in Europe and indeed it is four o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Um, I have followed these uh, conferences for a long time, so so I I know how important they are, and 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 and, and um, uh, all these uh, um, challenging issues that people discuss in these conferences. Um, I am I was very happy actually to to hear the presentation of uh, 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 Dr. Atkinson. Um, I largely agree with it. Um, I have a, a, a short PowerPoint, uh, and you will see how many things are similar. Um, if I may show it, if I may share my screen, please uh, for, a, for a few moments. Um, <clears throat> um, uh, let me see. You see this? Not yet. Okay, uh, we see it. Great. Yes. Okay. So, <clears throat> um, so um, um, everybody knows this graph, and it exactly exactly um, goes along with what Bob was uh, was talking about. Um, uh, the big gorillas are here, and and then Korea is somewhere at the bottom of this graph. This is from the science and engineering indicators, of course, of the National Science Foundation. Uh, the reason I show this is that uh, Korea has indeed done great, great things um, until now. It has succeeded a lot. Bob was showing uh, all the successes, and I will show some now. Uh, but uh, but the, the, the fact uh, is that uh, Korea on its own is relatively small. Um, so, right off the bat, it will need to make some choices. Uh, that's what small countries do. They make choices. Uh, the big countries that spend a whole lot more money, they can spend a whole lot more, more money, even though they spend less as a percent of their GDP than Korea. Um, but the amount is much bigger. Uh, the big countries can can afford to spread their resources uh, across the whole the whole horizon, um, but small countries will need um, to choose, and that's that's one thing that Korea is facing. Uh, faces. Now, um, another graph from from NSF is this one, and it agrees completely with what Bob was was showing. Here is Korea, uh, somewhere in the middle. And here is the uh, knowledge and technology intensive industries. Um, if you if you look uh, how how well uh, Korea is doing in terms of manufacturing, is uh, the the two bottom uh, parts of the of the graph and and relatively okay but not stellar performance up up here. It could do better, right? As Bob was saying, actually uh, the software and AI and so forth. Uh, if you look on the left, you see the U.S. and the U.K. Um, uh, much more emphasis on the soft um, than the hard, right? and you see the other countries uh, here on this graph. So, <clears throat> the big countries um, like the United States um, recently uh, we published a paper. It is actually the U.S. report in in the UNESCO Science Report, the latest science report. When we try to summarize the U.S. system, um, we, we, we could be a few, we could talk about a few broad technology platforms perhaps the country is interested in. And I know ITIF has, uh, has, has uh, written a lot. Actually, we used its reports quite a bit for this third bullet year, um, for the fifth then uh, generation of mobile technology. Um, but the United States is, is trying very hard in artificial intelligence, of course, as Bob said. Quantum is a very big thing. Cyber, of course, as we just heard. Um, um, these are big items, big big tickets that the U.S. is, is trying in some 
it's more successful than others, right? As we all know, in AI, successful in quantum, fairly okay, fairly good compared to China. In the fifth generation uh, mobile, not so good, right? Uh, we have failures, cyber with, with a lot of challenges, but, but, but uh, also some successes. And then the, 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 the strategic initiatives, uh, advanced manufacturing, maybe, um, uh, I'm sorry, um, um, maybe similar to, to industry 4.0, energy, environment, um, very good ticket for the country, uh, going back and forth with the different administrations, health, big item, many, several trillions of dollars expense, and, and space, um, space, which is uh, in our institute, a very big, a very big thing. Now, <clears throat> I wanted to, to, to bring you back 10 years, about 10 years ago, um, in a previous administration of Korea, um, um, there was a big report of the a big, uh, big uh, uh, report of the OECD about the Korean S uh, STI uh, policy system. I was involved in this, and then the administration produced um, uh, produced this uh, creative uh, that that was part of, right? The creative economy plan, uh, and and in that plan actually. Uh, 10 years ago, several of the things that Bob uh, offered to them for Korea um, were echoed. Um, so uh, the university industry uh, challenge, um, the, the, the uh, entrepreneurship, very, very uh, core part of that plan, um, the culture, how you make the culture, Korean culture more entrepreneurial, um, um, the creative destruction did not take so much attention then, um, but it is core here, it's absolutely core, and it is very core actually where I am today, because as Bob exactly said uh, very correctly, um, Europe has this, this issue, um, they don't want to lose things, um, they want to create new things, but they don't want to lose, uh, and... Um, in Schumpeterian thinking that that is almost impossible. Um, <clears throat> so um, <clears throat> um, um, I, I think, uh, I still think today that uh, that plan um, was, um, was actually hitting some critical issues um, uh, that Korea is facing, it is still facing, and, and it should actually uh, try to address uh, in the new administration. Um, the, challenge, the challenge of the dualism is big in Korea. Um, uh, it is uh, uh, for a long time now, I think the policy decision makers are aware of this. <clears throat> If, if Korea loses one or two of its biggest companies, the country will be in very serious trouble, right? Uh, and thus, um, the, the way to, 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 to actually become more resilient, <laughs> uh, as we just heard about this, is to grow uh, the smaller companies and grow medium-sized companies, uh, as Bob was saying, right? Um, so this entrepreneurship business and, and, and linking um, the academia with universities and also the big research institutes, right? We should not forget the big public research institutes of Korea. They have played a big role in the past. They still exist. They do a lot of work and they can, they can actually they be part of the system because they take a, a big chunk of the public budget for R&D, right? So if uh, somebody today would tell me what are policy pillars that, that different governments advanced of advanced countries, but also countries like the one that I deal in Latin America, like, like Brazil, right? Uh, another emerging economy, another one of the BRICS, um, the, the policy pillars um, would be uh, in the three bullets, exactly, first bullet, exactly what uh, Bob was talking about, 
um, research, economic growth, um, science and, and, and innovation, commercialization. We have actually uh, worked quite a bit on, on this topic and, and I have published with Korean colleagues, as you know, uh, Youngsook, uh, papers about this so with Korean data. Um, so Korea is trying, but there is, there is loom, room for uh, improvement there. The second, the second pillar is uh, sustainability. Of course, everybody talks about uh, various types of sustainability, not only environmental, uh, but uh, sometimes sustainability goes with this resilience and global value chains that, uh, that we just had. Um, but I want to stress also the inclusion um, in the United States and in several other countries now, this has become a key issue in, in science and technology policy. Um, and, and I remember the director of our National Science Foundation uh, gave the uh, Bromley Memorial Lecture that we organized with the University of Ottawa last year. And, and he was talking about the missing millions uh, in other words, the, the millions of people who could engage in this system, but somehow they, they, they remain outside. And, and in East Asia, um, I think uh, the social inclusion goes hand in hand with gender issues uh, in science and technology. And that will be also a, a, a challenge, in my view, uh, that Korea needs to address. Uh, I know you are aware already of this, but, but it's a continuing and, and you will need to address it. Um, and, and, and finally, um, the last is how we all deal together with the global challenges, the big global challenges that no country alone can, can, can solve, right? Um, and what is Korea's role in, those, uh, in solving uh, the challenges? like the environment, for example, but also other, other issues like health. Um, and that will, will define uh, partly where Korea goes in the s &P. And I want to stop here, uh, looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nick. Um, well, uh, you, uh, you pointed out uh, several important uh, uh, points, uh, but uh, I would like to highlight that you provided uh, three, uh, you, know, uh, you know, major uh, directions that uh, Korea has to uh, aim. Uh, one is the economic uh, growth, and another one is sustainability, and uh, uh, the last one is uh, global challenges. Korea has to uh, devote it to and contribute to it. Um, uh, it is, uh, I think, a very much uh, important one, and uh, you also uh, bring back uh, the creative economy, which is uh, quite, mm. you know, um, uh, in line with uh, Atkinson's, uh, Robert's, uh, you know, a point that, uh, you know, the creative uh, destruction uh, argument as well. Um, then uh, let me uh, invite uh, the last uh, panelist, uh, who is... Um, uh, right now, a senior research fellow at STAPI, uh, and uh, he was former um, uh, vice president of the STAPI, and he, you know, uh, uh, taking uh, various you know, positions uh, uh, as an advisor and, and um, uh, direct, uh, directors uh, <coughs> for many uh, national level uh, as a science technology policy uh, fora. Uh, let me invite uh, Jungwon Lee. Floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Chang. And uh, first of all, uh, thank for the Dr. Atkinson for your insightful presentation. Uh, I think you are already an expert in in Korean estate <coughs> policy, and I uh, mostly I agree with uh, Dr. Atkinson's uh, challenges and also solutions. Uh, but uh, actually, I entered the uh, STEPI to work in uh, 1994. Uh, at that time, we uh, considered uh, some challenges of Korean STI policy or system. And this year, I will retire, and we are suffering the same challenges. Many of them are mentioned by the Dr. Atkinson. Uh, 
and we still uh, try to find out the answers uh, and what are the real or root causes of that uh, challenges. So uh, in, in this, uh, this question, I like to mention about uh, some root causes or other perspectives on the challenges raised by Dr. Atkinson uh, based on the innovation ecosystem. First, uh, he mentioned about the innovation dualism and also technical transfer uh, from university or to industry in, in any way. And it is related to the openness of the innovation system or innovation ecosystem. I found that there are many indicators in Korean STI system shows that there is a low or lower than average of advanced countries in the linkage between or among the R&D performers or innovators like uh, private companies and public research institute as well as university. There should be very effective and efficient flows between these R&D performers in terms of knowledge, and fund as well as researchers. But in all three perspectives in Korean innovation system, they are lack of uh, these kinds of linkage or flows. It makes it difficult to uh, effective a technical transfer between the uh, innovators. It is the same situation with the Korean STI system with the uh, uh, global innovation network. So it, it is the same with uh, situations. So if you think of the why they are uh, not, not, not effective to current transfer in Korean system, one of the reason is lack of openness or lack of flows among the R&D performers, I think. And also he mentioned about the uh, entrepreneurship. And we know that the Korean government, uh, as Professor Bonotas mentioned, that uh, from more than 10 years ago, uh, we, uh, one of the slogans of the Korean government is creative economy. And more than that time, also Korean government always uh, have a, a lot of uh, policies to uh, promote startups. But I think there we, we need to make clear recognition of uh, why we need startups in our innovation system. Many governments, they say that uh, for the job creation, we need to increase startups. But I think this is a little different thing. I'm not sure about uh, how many job creation can be occurred based on the startups. But more important is that if we think about the innovation model, uh, actually the uh, dynamic innovation model of the autobac, and if we extend that model uh, based on the first generation R&D model, then there are very large gaps between or in the process of a platform transition period. I think one of the critical role of the startup is to, is a kind of bridge, bridging between these kinds of a platform transition. Because so large companies, they are uh, very slow to move or change. But many startups, they are very agile <coughs> and speedy in technological innovation as well as uh, market transition. So these startups can do such a, a bridging role in the extended dynamic innovation model. And AI is very important, I also agree. But more important thing is 
Korean researchers in AI, they should know why AI is important in Korean STI system or STI policy. It means that in, in Korea, especially in public R&D system, I think there is a, a lack of a strategic fitness of the national goal in R&D programs. It means that each researcher in university or public research institute, they should know how their R&D performance or outcomes can contribute to the national goals. But there is no such a, a fitness or a clear recognition about how they can contribute. AI is the same, I think. We, if we focus on the AI technology, we, the, the policy should make clear about how AI can contribute national goals of Korea. So if we see the impact or the uh, contribution, then we can set some R&D portfolio focusing on AI or software. I think this is first we have to do. Unfortunately, one of my hypotheses is that um, so-called SNT cartel is uh, one of the barrier that the or silo uh, which interrupt or which, which hinder from the multidisciplinary or uh, interdisciplinary R and D or researches. Many researchers in early ages, they try to find fund from the government or any other sources. But if uh, after they get some stable positions, I called it a cartel, then they just uh, safe and stable in their positions. I, I think this, this is just a hypothesis, but one, one data shows that the, uh, I see the R&D portfolio or R&D proportion of uh, for many years in Korean government, they are almost the same. There is no change. Even the government uh, priority has changed, but uh, the R&D portfolio has uh, keep maintained uh, regardless of the, their R&D priority. And when it comes to the creative destructions, uh, I like to mention about the dynamics of the innovation system. In Korean STI system, we are in lack of dynamics. Dynamics means, or well, it includes uh, open and cooperative R&D. As I already mentioned, the linkage between the R&D performers uh, and dynamics needs uh, agility with the active discussion and fast and transparent decision-making process. And dynamic system usually have has uh, uh, multi-dimensional goals or uh, multi-dimensional objectives. It is a dynamic system. And in dynamic system, uh, it means that the risk taking and free to fail. And also, uh, many years ago, Korean government has uh, a new R&D program called uh, uh, X-Event. It means that they uh, try to get some, try to receive some questions or problems from the people or usually for the, from the students and make a raise about uh, questions that have uh, never been asked before. Unfortunately, many Korean students, they are just being educated to solve problem only, not just to make problem. 
um, not just make uh, equations. But dynamic system, dynamic innovation system, we need a problem definition, not just problem solving. And finally, in dynamic innovation system, we need the diversity. There are many research papers how diversity can increase innovation activities. The diversity includes uh, sexuality and the ages, as well as religions or culture and nationality. All kinds of diversity is a positive to the increasing innovation activity. And it will increase the dynamics of innovation system. Finally, for the, the theme of this symposium for the, another jump in SDA policy in Korea, I like to recommend that the more important is to have a common vision or a goal for STI policy. As uh, Professor Bonotas also mentioned, the STI pillars, I think it's almost the same. For example, one of the, my opinion about the vision of STI policy is sustainable growth for economic sustainability, environmental sustainability, and social sustainability. And my question to Dr. Atkinson is that, in, in that sense then, what would be the government's role in this new uh, STI policy framework? For example, one of the, my uh, thought idea is that about the uncertainty. Now we are moving more, more uncertain environment of technological innovation, then one of the government role is to reduce technological uncertainty, market uncertainty, as well as institutional uncertainty. Just my opinion, and uh, I'd like to know uh, how Dr. Atkinson think about the government's role. That's all, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, gentlemen. Um, well, you uh, uh, provided some uh, deeper uh, insights on uh, each um, uh, directions of Korean uh, STI policy has to uh, aim. Uh, you, ju you just mentioned the, uh, some uh, root uh, causes of each um, I know, uh, challenges. Especially, um, I would like to uh, pick up uh, your argument that uh, we need uh, you know, more clear vision and a more uh, dynamic and a flexible uh, ecosystem. And also uh, you uh, questions about the um, uh, government role in uh, uh, pursuing these uh, the challenges and uh, directions. Well, uh, the last uh, you know, uh, point is exactly that I would like to uh, address, I mean, uh, ask to all of uh, uh, panelists, and is including uh, uh, Rob's uh, 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 perspective as well. Because, um, you know, in order to um, aiming um, some clear uh, directions, uh, we just identified some uh, challenges. In order to uh, address effectively, uh, we need some strategic uh, directions and government role should be uh, more strategic and uh, strong enough. Uh, but uh, many uh, um, experts also uh, uh, pointed out that uh, Korea need to be, um, the Korean government need to be sat back a little bit uh, to um, you know, uh, give the more flexibility and openness and um, um, uh, more creative uh, ecosystem. So I'd like to invite uh, uh, Robert uh, for your reactions on uh, these discussions. Floor is yours. Thank you. So those are three really fascinating conversations or discussions, uh, presentations. I really learned a lot and enjoyed them. Um, you know, Dr. Lee, when you were mentioning the question of linkages, and I've, I've seen some studies uh, that say that, 
It reminded me of one of the groundbreaking books in U.S. innovation policy back in 1994 by a professor at UC Berkeley, Anna Lee Saxenian. And it was a book called Regional Advantage. And I don't know if people in the science and tech policy community in Korea have read it, but if you haven't read it, it really, really, to me, might be quite useful. Because what it did is it compared the more open, porous, heavily linked ecosystem of Silicon Valley to the more hierarchical and separated innovation ecosystem of, of Boston or what they call Route 128 in Massachusetts. And I thought it was a very compelling, uh, a lot of people really found it a very compelling study. And over time, Massachusetts has become more like Silicon Valley, much more interlinkages and between federal labs, universities, et cetera, and companies, big and small. So it, it struck me as that maybe Korea, Korea reminds me of Boston 30 years ago. Um, and maybe it needs to be a little bit more now like Silicon Valley and more networked. I mean, I, I, to me, and listening to Dr. Lee, to me, it struck me, maybe the biggest question for Korea is what is the ultimate goal? And I, when we look around the country, or look around the world, I, I really see two goals competing. Uh, and they're certainly competing in the US. Uh, one is sustainability. And whether it's um, uh, kind of social sustainability, as, as Dr. Von Artis talked about, which is certainly important, or environmental sustainability. That's one big goal that, that countries could follow. The other goal would be maybe a little bit more like Andrew, uh, uh, Dr. Grotto was saying, and perhaps what I was saying, would be beating China. And I don't mean it in the heavy competition way, but look, China is, is really working to gain even more of that share of the pie. Um, and, and they seem, you know, on, they don't seem to be phased by anything. They, they're just gonna continue to do that. <clears throat> so I think at one level, the question for the U.S. certainly, but also Korea is which is more important. Certainly, to some extent, they're complementary. Uh, if you develop a robust, I know, for example, if you look at companies like LG, which is opening up a battery plant in the U.S., and uh, and I think S uh, Hy Hynix, uh, SK is uh, doing that as well. Certainly, they're complementary. You get competitiveness, you get innovation, you also get sustainability. But at one level, perhaps you need to um, really um, pick one. The last point I, I, just, I just say is I thought um, this point that Dr. Lee said about reducing market technology and organizational uncertainties, I really, that to me is really right on the mark. There's been a number of good studies of DARPA in the last few years, including by my, um, by my colleague at um, uh, Erica, Erica Fuchs at Carnegie Mellon, uh, and one of the key things that DARPA did is it reduced techno technological uncertainty. That was part of its role and, 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 uh, and to some extent reduced market uncertainty. So I do think that's an important role for government. Uh, it doesn't obviously have to do everything, but um, I think with the way these new technologies are emerging and they're so, they're so ubiquitous and affecting so many parts of the economy, it, they raise a whole set of questions around organizational uncertainty is a new way of organizing a market or a sector viable. And sometimes the government can play a role in that by uh, perhaps by just procurement saying, hey, we're gonna now be more open to buying FinTech products or services, or we're gonna be more open to buying 3D printed buildings than we might've been before. So I think that to me, that's an interesting way to frame it is, is how can the government provide, particularly high, high growth entrepreneurs and sorry for going on. And this last thing, I just can't resist. I can't. I I look at Korea. Uh, to me, one of the biggest problems in Korea is, uh, and it's similar to Europe to me. And it's this sort of conflation of high growth entrepreneurship with SMEs, and they're very very different, as as you all know. And uh, you know, Schumpeterian SMEs are not your mom and pop open up a restaurant SMEs. And I think that. Uh, Countries just don't, you don't get innovation and growth from just getting more SMEs. You get innovation and growth by getting more high growth, innovative, disruptive startups. Uh, so I do think that's an important distinction to, uh, to really just keep, keep hammering home on. So thank you. Thank you, Lop. Um, you, uh, um, you know, 
highlighted the uh, you know high uh, gross uh, entrepreneurs, uh, which is uh, you know quite uh, um, painful <laughs> to uh, Korea uh, up to now. Uh, I guess uh, this is one of the uh, you know, very uh, critical uh, points that um, uh, we should you know, keep in mind. Another one is um, you know complementary um, um, aspects of uh, sustainability and. Uh, um, um, uh, uh, geopolitical uh, in a conflict on, on this uh, in, in, in terms of the uh, ultimate goals. Well, um, I'd like to, well, since we are uh, run out of time, um, uh, we should wrap it up, but uh, I'd like to uh, uh, revisit uh, the China risk. What I mean is that uh, 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 Andrew uh, already uh, uh, talked about uh, this one, but uh, many uh, experts and many uh, people uh, argue that is it just a matter of choice or uh, should, is there any other uh, a, I mean, uh, approach uh, to uh, strategically approach to this uh, geopolitical uh, ones? Because uh, China uh, is big market uh, to uh, Korea um, and uh, also the climate change and health, uh, you know, global health uh, issues, we definitely need um, uh, Chinese co collaboration. Is there any, um, you know, the, the, the effective ways to bring them in a global innovation system? So uh, I'd like to uh, invite um, any of you um, on this issue. Um, Rob? Do you have any um, uh, remarks on this? Sure, I do. A couple of remarks. One is, um, I'm less um, I'm less of the view that we need cooperation with China on these issues. Uh, we could have used cooperation with COVID, and they refused to provide it, and they still refuse to provide cooperation on COVID. So, when it comes to climate, I think ultimately. It's not that we need cooperation with them. To me, climate will be addressed when we develop better and cheaper technologies. That, that really is the key to me of climate change, whether it's uh, carbon capture or better batteries or better nuclear or whatever it might be. And China, frankly, is not a, is not a climate a clean energy innovator. They're a clean energy producer, but they're not an innovator. Uh, Japanese, Korean, European, American companies are much more innovative on, on clean energy. So I don't think we need China, frankly. I don't want to diminish the sort of, there's a phrase in the US, you're between a rock and a hard place. In other words, <laughs> there's no good choice. And I, I certainly don't want to diminish Korea's position there because I understand that you can't just, you can't be, uh, take as hard an edge as the United States takes and nor, nor do I think US policymakers would expect that. But what I would hope is that there could be a little bit more of a global alliance, whether it's through the IPEF that the Biden administration is creating or our AUKUS or whatever it might be, and that part of that global alliance led by the U.S., and I, I just say that because whoever's leading, it's going to take the most of the heat, most of the criticism from China, and I think the U.S. is willing to do that, uh, willing to bear that responsibility, if you will. So I think if we could do that, if we could get the Europeans a little bit more engaged, I know the Japanese seem quite willing to be engaged in this kind of alliance. I do think if we stood together arm in arm, um, that it would be a safer environment for Korea to begin to raise some of these issues and to begin to take some joint actions, whether it's on forced technology transfer issues or our IP theft issues and the like. So I get why Korea doesn't want to step out in front right now. And if I were you, I wouldn't want to either. But I'm hopeful that if we have a leadership in the U.S. that makes this a priority, and frankly, so far we don't, uh, but maybe we will, that I would hope Korea would engage and, and join along with us. Thank you. Um, Andrew or uh, Nick, do you have any uh, short comments? Uh Young, young. Yep, uh, Nick. Yeah, young. Sir. I want to go back to the role of the government um, in entrepreneurship. I think uh, both hit it well. The role of the government in a country 
on the frontier now. Korea is on the frontier, right? The role of the government is different than it was when Korea was trying to close the gap. However, in the new technologies that they are developing now, um, I think the government has a critical role in de-risking um, uh, the system. So what Bob was saying, organizations like DARPA or RPAE or whatever ARPAs those are those, but in combination with demand on the other side, which is uh, procurement. And this is a tool that has been underutilized by the government for smart, for, for smart um, technologies. I think, I think the government can put together smart ways of de-risking the environment and enabling entrepreneurship. Really, I do. Um, we, uh, uh, it will take a little bit more thinking on our, on our part, but uh, um, there are ways the governments can interfere without uh, being heavy-handed. I don't, I don't uh, say heavy-handed government, mm. but smart government that on the one hand um, um, uh, create, uh, closes, I, I mean, takes some critical bottlenecks, and on the other hand, creates uh, the first market for uh, new technologies, I would be a good step to move forward. Great, uh, thank you. Uh, smart government uh, is uh, one of the key uh, solutions that we have to. Uh, Jungwon, do you have any uh, short comments? No. It's okay. okay. Well, uh, I wish uh, I could. We could, you know, extend uh, uh, very much <laughs> on this. This discussion is very uh, fruitful. Uh, let me, um, you know, uh, summarize. Oh, not not a summarize, but uh, to pick up uh, some takeaways. Um, well, uh, the Robert, uh, you know, uh, pointed out uh, many critical uh, challenges and solutions that. Uh, um, uh, we should, uh, you know, uh, keep in mind in next uh, five years. Uh, these challenges and, uh, and uh, solutions we think of uh, for a long time. Um, I, I think that it is a continuous, uh, um, you know, uh, problems or uh, challenges. Um, the main uh, task uh, might be uh, that how to smartly, you know, how to strategically uh, address it um, and how to do it. It is one of the you know, key challenges that um, uh, next government, uh, next administration uh, should uh, you know, pay attention to it. Well, um, since we run out of the time, uh, I would like to wrap up and I would like to uh, extend my um, sincere uh, thanks to uh, Rob uh, Andrew and Nick and Jungwon, thank you for great discussion and uh, your uh, participation. Thank you so much and good night um, to <laughs> two of you, <laughs> uh, three of you, and thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, moderator Dr. Zhang, and thanks again to our wonderful speaker and panelists for an insightful discussion. Now we will have one hour break and start session one at 1.30 p.m. We would deeply appreciate your continued interest in session one as well. We will come back at 1.30 p.m. Thank you. <laughs>